We have delayed the start of our scheduled program to bring you a bulletin from CBS News. Two helicopters carrying the United Nations ceasefire team left Khe Song shortly before 9 o'clock Sunday morning Korean time. Communist officers are already in Khe Song to participate in the preliminary ceasefire talks. This bulletin has come to you from CBS News. We now resume our scheduled program. Most Saturdays at this time, we spend an exciting half hour of adventure and action with America's public hero number one, Hop Along Cassidy. Well, even two-fisted cowboys take summer vacations when they can, and Hoppy is no exception. Hop Along and Topper will be back with us riding the CBS Air Trails again 11 weeks from tonight, September 22nd. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, A Seaside Sabbatical. Wire in my hand said it all. Need your help, urgent. Meet me at 8.30 tonight, Ship's Galley Cafe, Long Beach. Signed, Dale Higgins. The time and the place were known factors, the need for help, the urgency, and most of all, Dale Higgins were unknown. And my hazy recollection of algebra told me that three unknowns are mathematically impossible to find. Call it a challenge, call it money, call it a chance for a shore dinner, call it anything you like. But 8.15 found me pulling into a parking lot on Ocean Boulevard, not far from the amusement pier. Just leave it there, I'll be right with you. Oh, hello, Mr. Marlowe. Hiya, Red. How's it going? Oh, great, thanks. What brings you to the capital of Iowa? Corn. <laughs> my aim's getting bad, Red. I thought I'd come down to the pike and try for my limit at a shooting gallery. Gee, really? Yeah. Greatest practice in the world. Is it still 35 cents and no questions asked? Huh? Oh, to park the car. Yeah, uh-huh. that's it. Okay, kid, keep it. Oh, thanks. Hey, I, I mind if I recommend the quick quack? How's that again? Used to be the dead duck. Best shooting gallery on the pike for my dough. Oh, that quick quack. Oh, sure. Anybody be a fool to go anywhere else, Yeah. Huh? My sentiments exactly. See you, Red. You bet, Mr. Marlowe. Red's a nice kid. His name was a natural. He was blonde. I bobbed along Ocean Boulevard in a direction that instinct and a blaring blue neon sign indicated would lead me on course to the ship's galley. The night was muggy and close. You wore it like an extra coat. And the ocean breeze I'd anticipated had retired in favor of alternate waves of fog that rolled in, engulfed you for a moment, and then suddenly rolled out again. I was very nearly on time for my 8.30 appointment with Dale Higgins as I turned blue beneath the ship's galley neon and stepped inside to be greeted by tight little groups of faces that opened and closed to admit food, drink, and talk, all indigo. The door behind me closed on two thoughts. My dreams of a shore dinner were blasted, and the ship's galley emerged as the last place in the world for anyone in need of urgent help to discuss his problems. But then, I didn't know Dale Higgins. Are you Philip Marlowe, by any chance? That's right. Yes, it looked like you were looking for someone. I'm Higgins. Oh, oh how are you, Higgins? Do we talk here? Uh, probably not very well. No. Uh, walk along the beach? Oh, fine, fine. Now... Oh. Say, Higgins, did you ever wonder why people pack into hot little rooms on a night like this? Oh, you mean the ship's galley? Yeah. Well, philosophy is not my business, Marlowe. What is? Well, I don't quite know how to tell you, I guess. Well, your wire said urgent. That's good enough for openers. Yes, well, the truth is I was a little quick sending that wire. Oh? I was pretty upset about a situation at the time, but things have resolved themselves now. I won't require any help. Uh Uh-huh. Well, you ought to know. I expect to pay you, of course, the trip down and your customary fee. That'll be 25 a day in expenses. Seven cents a mile for 23 miles and, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, 35 cents for parking my car. Uh, uh, seven times 23, dollar 60, 61, uh, 35. Dollar 96. 26, 96 uh, altogether. Uh, is uh, cash all right, I suppose? <laughs> it always has been. 
Uh, Marlo, I am sorry about this. I didn't set out to bring you on a wild goose chase. But... Yes, looks like I've got the right amount. Thanks. Don't worry about it, Higgins. Anybody can change his mind. Yes, I, I guess that's right. Well, uh, thanks for your trouble. Not at all. Eh, yeah, well. Mm-hmm. Mr. Marlowe! Hmm? Mr. Marlowe, wait! I turned in the direction of her voice, but the fog has a cute way of diffusing sound as well as sight. And I realized I wasn't closing in on anything, that the fog was circling me and I was circling it. So I stopped and waited. I listened and heard nothing but the sound of the sea and the faint wheezing of the pike calliope. Then suddenly it hit me. Somewhere along the fog-swept beach, a girl had called my name. And nobody knew I was in Long Beach except Red at the parking lot and Dale Higgins. Yeah, the choice was obvious. Did she find you okay, Mr. Marlowe? Yeah, yeah, Red, she did. You tell her where I was? Oh, I sure. I told her you and me always did our shooting at the Quick Quack. Good boy. Now tell me who she is. Who she is? Yeah. You, you mean you, you don't know her, Mr. Marlowe? That's the general idea, Red. Well, well, I, I, I guess she's my age. Yes, I know. Who is she? She's... Yeah. She's... You, you want your car, Mr. Marlowe? <laughs> no, Red, not now. I think I left something back at the Quick Quack. Everything that was young and pretty along the pike was hanging onto a sailor's arm. Around Gene Arno's Quick Quack, the nearest thing to youth and beauty with a neatly lined 22s poised across the counter. Try your luck, mister. No, no, thanks. Just looking, I'm not buying. Yeah, see, I just lost my girl. Well, don't blow your brains out here. These guns is for shooting ducks. I see what you mean. We said we'd meet here if we got separated. Have you seen her by any chance? She's seven, eight feet tall, glandular case. She's three stalls down, build a toothpick. Thanks so much. Still just looking, not buying. Still just look... Try it from a distance. It looks even better. Go on, bud. Beat it. I spotted her. At least I'd spotted a frightened fawn of a thing who caught my eye as if we were the only two on the pike. And there was something about her that made me wish we were. I followed her away from the crowded amusement section up the ramp toward Ocean Boulevard. Suddenly she broke into a run, darted into an alleyway. I wasn't far behind her. No one saw you, did they? Follow me. Like who? He might have. And there may be others. I don't know. I don't know. That makes two of us. Now, wait a minute. Let's talk, huh? I saw you meet him. I thought it was you at the parking lot. I saw you meet him. The ship's galley. Something like you lost in a mob. I'll kill you, you know. If you're with them, I'll kill you. I've got to before someone kills me. I don't know. I don't know about you. Now, listen, you. baby. Baby, I'm with you. Don't come in here. All right, all right. I can't be seen with you. I can't walk out of here with you. He's around somewhere. I know he is. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, you'll help me. You'll have to. There isn't anyone else. Of course I will. Of course I will. Well, then look. As soon as you can, get your car. Don't let Val see you now. Val? You know Val. Listen, in your car, meet me at 7th and Anaheim. I'll get there. I'll have to. And then we can talk. Yeah, but wait a minute. 7th Hold it. 7th and Anaheim, Mr. Marlowe. Oh, I, I, I'm Dale Higgins. <laughs> It was a study in contrast all the way. The din and kaleidoscope of Rainbow Pier against the lonely sound of a foghorn. The gray feel of fog in the dank gray black of the warehouse district at 7th and Anaheim. An urgent wire signed Dale Higgins. Eh, Dale Higgins. And a guy who called himself Higgins. Husband? Lover? What? Well, here we go again, Marlowe. I parked the car and waited. The fog hugged the streetlight, but the sign was intermittently visible. I had the right place. I don't know how long it was before I heard the footsteps, but it was long enough for me to stretch my legs out along the car seat, lean my head back against the door, and feel the damp touch of fog sweep against my face from an open window. I remember starting to turn my head toward the direction of the steps and thinking that Dale had made it in good time. Oh! <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, just as systematic exercise builds a strong body, so does systematic saving build a strong future. Save systematically for your future and for your country's future with United States defense bonds. 
And now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe in tonight's story, A Seaside Sabbatical. I could almost hear the chain pulleys clanking the first time I opened my eyes. And it took another game try before the fuzz faded away and the room slowed down to a Lambeth walk. Off somewhere, the faint sound of breakers. And I did the ceiling, the walls, and one corner of an expensively furnished room before I sent it on the fuzzy, indeterminate face at my bedside. A kind face, motherly and pleasant. It talked. I'm Mrs. Higgins. Oh, oh no. Yes, yes, I am. Yeah. Is everybody in Long Beach named Higgins? You don't really feel a bit well, do you? No. No, not really. Oh, we're awfully sorry, Mr. Marlowe. I know when Dale realizes what she's done, she'll be sorry, too. Yeah, I spoke. Dale bean me? What, with a peer? She's often violent, I'm afraid. Such a high-strung girl. Gives way so easily, you know. Yeah. Imagines all sorts of things and then, well, just gives way. Yeah, yeah. But I won't worry you with that. Dale's my problem. Uh -huh. I, I won't worry you with anything, Mr. Marlowe. Just you get a nice rest. I'm a cinch. We'll pay whatever damages there are, of course. But I won't hear of you leaving now until you're much better. Oh. oh. Hey. Oh. oh. The mother of the Higgins clan had locked the door and walked away. My head felt big and woozy and rammed down into my neck. I was not in the pink. Mother Higgins had ordered a nice rest and it looked like I'd need it. But I don't like strange rooms and locked doors and high-strung girls who give way. I'm still trying to get out of bed when another door clicked slowly open on the other side of the room. My little frightened fawn was back. And my head hurt. I heard Marie with you. That's how I knew you were here. Oh, poor Mr. Marlowe. Did they hurt you? They sure did. It wouldn't do, you know, if they found me talking to you. I... I feel better now that you're here. I wish I did. What happened to you? Do you know? I have a rough idea. Say, honey, how much do you weigh? 105 when I left the convent. But that, that's not important. Listen, I, I can't stay long. You know, a romance with you would be rough. Please, Mr. Marlowe. They're going to kill me. Val and Marie, I... All right, all right. Now settle down. They are. And I don't know why. Maybe if I knew why, I'd understand. Yeah, but listen, I... I didn't even know Val then. Val? Val Nichols. A friend of Marie's. She sent him to the boat to meet me. and Ever since then, I just know they are going to kill me. Dale, listen to me. <gasps> now, I don't know Val. As a matter of fact, until you told me, I thought his name was Higgins. And I don't know Marie. But what makes you think they're going to kill you? You met Val last night. The ship's galley. You talked to him. And Marie was just here. Oh, don't, don't try to confuse me. You're all I have. All right, honey. But tell me, isn't Marie your mother? My stepmother. Daddy's dead. And when I got off the Orange Coast the other night, whenever it was, uh, there was Val. The Orange Coast? That's how I came back. Um, Mr. Muller, you, you, you're not trying to understand. If you won't help me, then... He's coming. Don't let him... I hope that you're not bothering Mr. Marlowe, Dale. No. No, I'm not. He asked me to come in. He, he likes me. Of course he does, dear. We all do. No. Feeling better, Mr. Marlowe? The worst way. Oh, I'm sorry. Come, Dale. Let's let Mr. Marlowe rest. Oh, you could use a little rest yourself, my dear. No. He wants me to stay. I'm not bothering. Oh, you're not bothering at all, honey, but... Maybe it would be better if you come back a little later. Yes, huh? yes, of course it would, dear. Now, come along now. I can come back, though, Mr. Marlowe. You promise? Sure. Well, if you promise, I, I know you'll keep it. Never mind, Val. I came in alone, you know. I can find my way out. She's sweet. She's sick. A very sick young lady, Marlowe. Troubled confused. She's got nothing on me. 
Now, look, what is this all about? I don't know what day it is, what I'm doing here, who you are, anything. Well, it, it should all have ended with our meeting at the ship's galley last evening, Marlowe. You're not clearing anything up for me, you know. You've seen her, talked to her. You must realize that she imagines things. Right now, she imagines that she's been away from here a long time, that she came back a few days ago upon a ship, that her mother and I want to kill her. She did send me the wire, Oh, though. yes, yes. Well, we had no idea one of her spells was coming on. We left her for a short time yesterday. The switchboard has its instructions, of course, and they reported it to Mrs. Higgins when we returned. So we, we thought it best if I met you and... Uh, Called well, me off. Uh, it's, it's not in your line, Marlowe. You're right. I'm going to keep it that way, too. And Mrs. Higgins realizes that she's going to have to do something about Dale. Institution, perhaps, some long-range treatment at any rate. Dale was in no condition to be running around last night playing mysteries taking up your time. Whoever hit me in the head last night was in pretty good condition. If I had gotten there two minutes sooner, I could have spared you all that. You were following her? No, no, no. I was coming back from my boat. I had gone down to the harbor after I left you. Oh. It's on the way back, I just happened to see Dale, and knowing the state she was in, I followed her, of course. I see. She doesn't know she hit me, does she? <laughs> I don't believe that she has the slightest idea what happened. <laughs> Things started swimming again. Val Nichols became part of the draperies. I was trying to think, but it hurt. Everything hurt. The chain pulleys were lowering my eyelids again. And that was all for a while. The next time I tried, I was more successful. The sunlight was streaming in the room. The clock on the night table visible for the first time said it was almost noon. So I got up. It was still pretty fuzzy on the edges, but I found my clothes hung neatly in the closet. Managed to get them on in the right order and made it to the door that had been locked before, but it wasn't this time. Mr. Marlowe, you shouldn't be up. Well, I'm always flying in the face of great odds, Mrs. Higgins, Bill's character. Well, even <laughs> so, you should stay in bed a while. Oh, really, I'm fine, thanks. Oh, but you're not leaving, I won't think of it. You'll lunch with us at least. No, no, really. No, I've got to go, but I'd like to see Dale first. I sort of promised her I would. Oh, my. She's sleeping, Mr. Marlowe. Oh? We gave her a sedative. Doctor's orders, of course. She's had such a trying time, you oh, know. Oh, I wouldn't want I... to disturb her, no. But maybe I can call later. Oh, huh? that would be so thoughtful of you. I know she'll be disappointed at not seeing you, but I... Oh, Val, I... Uh... Up and about so soon, Marlowe? Yes, uh, Well, I... she's sleeping, isn't she, Val? Hmm? The sedative and all, I mean, I was just telling Mr. Oh, Marlowe yes, that... Oh, yes, yes, She's resting very well, Marie. Now, don't, don't fret about her. Well, I'll take you to your car, Marlowe. Uh, oh, oh, yes. Well, Mrs. Higgins, it's been... Oh, uh... it's been downright dreadful, and I know it, Mr. Marlowe. If I can do anything to right this terrible wrong, please let me know. Well, if I can think of anything, I'll let you know. <laughs> Goodbye, Mrs. Higgins. Tell Dale goodbye for me, will you? Oh, yes. Yes, of course I will. Well, it uh, looks like another lovely day, doesn't it? I followed Val Nichols' lead to an elevator and for the first time discovered that I was in an apartment hotel on a different stretch of Ocean Boulevard than the one I'd grown to loathe the night before. Val filled in a few last details as he walked me to my car in the underground garage. Seems he'd driven Dale and me to the apartment from 7th and Anaheim in my car and sent a lackey back for his. It fit. We shook hands, and that hurt my head, too. I drove off. Somewhere in the harbor district, the need for coffee and a few lungful of ocean air forced my hand. I parked the car and found both in a ship-shaped spot with a clear view of the docks. The first cup cleared my head... And the second one down there cleared the counter. Hey, watch it. I am. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. It'll wipe up. How about you, get any on you? No, no, I don't think so. You, uh, you know anything about ship schedules? Like what? Like that first one out there at anchor. The Orange Coast? Yeah. Well, seems to me she landed three or four nights ago. Don't know how long she'll be tied up. She's a fruit boat, though. Their office is just a block from here. Oh? More than likely, their book's solid, but if you want to check... Uh, yes, Mr. 
Mr. Marlowe. There was a passenger Higgins on the Orange Coast when it docked Tuesday. Uh, Miss Higgins it was, Miss Dale Higgins, according to our records. Any record of where she boarded the boat? Let's see now. Oh, yes, at Macapa. Macapa? Brazil. Macapa, Brazil. Was she traveling alone by any chance? I really don't know. There's nothing here to... Any other Higginses aboard? No. Hmm. How about a passenger named Nichols? Any chance of that? No, no Nichols either. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. It was my turn to send a wire, only it was a cable this time. And it was going to be a while between answers, so I checked into a nice, clean, inconspicuous hotel. Had some food and a half bottle of aspirin and placed two phone calls. Dale Higgins was still resting comfortably, according to her stepmother. But Muff Benjamin was still willing to do anything for a buck. He was there in no time. I heard you were here, Marlowe. Something big? Could be. You tell me you're the guy who hears things. About you being here? Mm -hmm. Oh, you know how it goes. People see people, people tell people. It's nothing. Yeah, I know. It happens all the time. Now, look, Muff, I gotta know things quick. Well, I, uh... For money. Who and what? All right. I get this. The name is Higgins. Mm -hmm. Man old enough to have an 18-year-old daughter. I don't know his first name. He's dead, I think. But the daughter's name is Dale. You got that? Uh Uh-huh. And the wife that's surviving is called Marie. Uh Uh-huh. They have an apartment on Ocean Boulevard, the shore, I think it is. I got it. Okay. Now, a guy named Val Nichols, check on him, too. And if Higgins is dead, find out about a will. I'm ahead of you. Good. Get back as soon as you can, huh? You double the dough, I'll double the speed. You double. Hello. Mr. Philip Marlowe, please. Speaking. I have a reply to your cable to Macapa, Brazil. Oh, good. Give it to me slow, huh? Dale Higgins accompanied to boat by none. None? Order of the Holy Cross has convent near here. Suggest you check there. Signed Emerson Ward, Macapa Fruit Exporting Company. Did you say Order of the Holy Cross? That's right. Do you wish to send a reply? No. No, not yet, anyway. Thanks. <laughs> You see, Father, if you could help me contact the convent in Brazil, I could find out how long Dale was a student there. That might shed some light on the situation, huh? I see. I'm not schooled in your ways, Mr. Marlowe. Still, we're both seekers after truth, aren't we? In this case, a very specific truth. That's right, Father. I want to help, of course. Your cable said this was a Sisters of the Holy Cross convent? Yes, If there were any way we could call down there. You see, Father, time's pretty important. Mm. If it's possible, we shall call, my son. Meanwhile, our prayers are with Miss Higgins. Come, Mr. Marlowe. My prayers were with the phone company, too. And with Muff. And, of course, Dale. Because if her version of things were true, she was in real trouble. And until I knew what it was for... There was very little I could do for her. Was the information from the sisters helpful, Mr. Marlowe? Well, they were very cooperative, Father. Dale's been a student there for almost seven years, winter and summer. Hmm. Her stepmother visited her every day, but Dale never left the convent until two weeks ago. Maybe it all fits, huh? I'll bless her, my son. Thank you, Father. And thank the sisters of the Holy Cross. Muff Benjamin was waiting at my hotel when I got back. (laughs) It was another study in contrasts. So far, I dealt with a priest, an informer, and a sister superior. And together, we were all coming close to an answer. His name was Dale Higgins, too, the doll's father. Died seven years ago, loaded. Yeah? Left his second wife, Maria, good income. But the big load went to the kid. All right, what'd you get on Val Nichols? Oh, he's a bad one. Yeah? Specialty is knocking down rich widows. Currently fraternizing with this Marie Higgins thing. Bless you, Muff. Huh? I mean, here's your dough. You do look so much better than when you left, Mr. Marlowe. Really? Is Dale still sleeping? Why, yes. I think I'll look in on her, huh? No, I I mean, I'd rather you didn't. Where is she, Mrs. Higgins? Mr. Marlowe, you have no... I wonder if she liked it at the convent. What? Seven years is a long time to be away from home. A lot of things can happen in seven years, you know, Mrs. Higgins. You can even end up legally dead. Why, I... 
I'm sure I don't have any idea. Dale's dad must have thought a lot of her. I'll bet she was pretty close to him, too. She, she was. They... Mr. Marlowe, what are you... Do you tell me, Mrs. Higgins. There's nothing to tell. Dale I... seems to think there is. Which room is hers? She... She isn't here. I... Oh, Mr. Marlowe, don't ask any more. Oh, no, she's with Val, huh? On his boat. Oh, how did this ever happen? I didn't want it this way. I thought if she could have been declared legally dead, oh, I'd have taken care of her. I, I, I mean, kept her there in the convent. No one knew she was there but Val. Val had to have her really dead. Is that expensive, Mrs. Higgins? Oh, help her, Mr. Marlowe. He'll do it this time. He'll kill her, I know. Believe me, I don't want How that. How long have they been gone? Not long. Half an hour, maybe, but no longer. I'll go with you. <laughs> Marie really cracked on the way to the harbor. It was going to be a fishing accident in the channel. And Val would get away with it, too, unless we found something that could outpower his 30-footer. It was called the Queen Marie, one guess who had given it to him. I found the boat I needed, all right, but the skipper seemed reluctant to go for it. Wildest thing I ever heard of. I tell you, it's a matter of life and death. The Coast Guard can't go on every... Look, look, a month ago we needed you off Balboa when I motor conked out and you came. But we've received no distress call from the Queen Marie. What do you think this is I'm giving you? Please, don't waste time talking. All right, come on, how about it? Okay, but if this isn't on the level, you're in some trouble, Marlowe. By the time we'd cleared the harbor, I knew Val didn't have a chance. Every boat in the area had been alerted. I didn't know about Dale, though. I just hoped the sedative Val had given her was merciful. The Coast Guard took care of Val once we came alongside the Queen Marie. And I took care of Dale. She was in the galley, tied securely. Still dopey, but she came around after a while. Oh. Mr. Marlowe, you... Take it easy, baby. You're okay. You... I was afraid you'd forgotten the promise. No. But you didn't, did you? It was night now. And the lights that stretched out along the shore looked friendly and warm. <laughs> friendly and warm. I wonder when people are going to realize that the only happiness there is in the world is what they can give each other. Happiness, that is. Not a stab in the back. But you know, there's one thing about me. Yeah, I have to admit it. I'm an optimistic fella. <laughs> The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Kathleen Height. Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, John Daner, Irene Tedrow, and Lee Millar, with Harry Bartell, Barney Phillips, Lou Krugman, Donna Hainer, and Stan Waxman. Gerald Moore may soon be seen in the Santana production, Sirocco. The special music is composed by Pierre Garagank, and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Be sure to listen again next week at the same time when Philip Marlowe says... This time an old lady got taken for a new kind of ride by a new kind of chauffeur, and I got involved up to a gun in my ribs, all because I decided to spend a quiet day at home. <laughs> Don't miss Broadway's My Beat, featuring Detective Danny Clover as the cop who knows every character, every star, every crook frequenting the Great White Way. It's tomorrow night at the Star's Address. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> This is CBS here, Horace Hyde, every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.